Today we have um, a wonderful Miller postdoctoral fellow who is here currently at UC Berkeley, hopefully through 2025, and she's working in the labs of Priya Morjani and Rory Rolfs. Uh, she has been working in a series of places. She started out actually at Santa Clara University in biochemistry and music, got her M I MPS. Mm -hmm. Master's in Professional Studies. Okay, <laughs> in forensic science at Penn State University, and then a PhD in evolutionary genetics at the Mons Planck in uh, evolutionary anthropology in 2022, and then had a postdoctoral fellow in San Francisco State University, and then migrated right over here that same year, 2022, with this wonderful Miller postdoctoral research fellowship where she is working with, with Priya, who is um, a affiliate of the archeological research facility. Uh, so today we're really thrilled to have her talk about her very current work, but I just wanna mention a few recent publications. In 2024, that's this year, she has an article in Nature called Homo sapiens reached the higher latitudes of Europe by 45,000 years ago. So that's a new date. On uh, 2024 in Nature, Ecology and Evolution, the ecology, subsistence, and diet of 45,000-year-old Homo sapiens of Ilzenhöhle in Rannis, Germany. In 2024, busy woman, uh, nature and ecology and evolution, stable isotopes show Homo sapiens dispersed into cold steppes around 45,000 years ago in the same site. Uh, so, that's obviously where she's working in. Uh, 2023 in Nature, Ancient Human DNA Recovered from a Paleolithic Pendant. That's totally wonderful. And a um, long time ago in 2022, in Genes, she published Ancient DNA Methods Improve Forensic DNA Profiling of Korean War and World War II Unknowns. So just remarkable uh, current work. Many awards and honors. Uh, the uh, national 2022 a National Institute for Justice Research Grant, which must be linked to that World War II project, maybe of two hundred sixty six thousand. Uh, the Miller, of course, is two hundred thirty four thousand. It's not only a stipend but research funds. And in twenty twenty one, a finalist in the International Society for Biomolecular Archaeology. And she got a Young Investigator Award in 2019, International Society for Applied Biological Sciences. So she's, um, I think we can safely say a stellar scholar in this domain. So she really clearly from those titles, you can tell in her uh, computational and laboratory work, she's working with um, archeological favorites, that's ancient degraded DNA in order to reconstruct human evolutionary history, uh, as well as other related mammals, I'm sure, and also uh, human, uh, sorry, historical human identifications, which obviously that forensic work seems to be still ongoing, which is fascinating, a completely different topic than today. So we're really thrilled to have you here. And you can see from her title that we're going to be learning about this very new research on this Upper Paleolithic Homo sapiens work uh, in Germany. So please welcome Dr. Elena Savala to ours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction. And I will, yes, be talking about uh, several of those papers in this uh, presentation today. Um, just to give a brief introduction to the time period that we're working on here, looking at here. Um, so I'll be talking about the out of Africa migration and what happened in Europe shortly after this. So early modern humans or homo sapiens originated around 300,000 years ago. There's some questions about that date uh, in Africa. And then around between 50 to 100,000 years ago, a subset of homo sapiens left Africa and then spread throughout the world. And when they left and entered Europe, they encountered Neanderthals, or did they? Uh, and also, well, yes, we know what they did. And then also Denisovans when they journeyed east. And so this is a bit of the plateau that we'll be talking about in uh, today. And especially this transition during this arrival after uh, humans came through Europe, where Neanderthals were there to begin with and then disappeared and uh, Homo sapiens were there towards the end of the Upper Paleolithic, so during this transition period. Um, 
And one of the challenges from a geneticist's point of view of working in this time period is that there's really sparse availability of data. And so this is a map of the world and showing that uh, if we look at individuals over 30,000 years old, each black dot represents a single site where we have genetic data. And as you can show, see, that's not representative of the entire world and everything that was going on. It makes it quite hard to make kind of general claims. Also, as all of you here can appreciate genetics is one portion of that puzzle. And so why, uh, while from my perspective, it's really interesting to try and understand these interactions between humans and Neanderthals, this didn't happen in a vacuum. We also need to understand climatic shifts, the environment, um, as well as it's a really interesting time period for not changes in just those areas, but there's also a lot of technological changes, uh, different types of artifacts that appear during this time. And I keep saying time because actually the timing of these events and shifts um, in each of those sub areas is also uh, not completely understood and will help us clarify how they each might have been related to each other as well. And that's what I'm hoping to talk about today. And so I'm doing that with three different uh, studies. Um, one is going to be focusing on this site in Germany, where we'll be talking about uh, this technology transition that occurred in Central Europe. We'll just be moving a little further east and then uh, forward in time, about 10,000 years, to talk about Upper Paleolithic burials. And this is from a site in Poland. And then we'll take quite a journey, even further east, all the way over to Denise of a cave, and for, uh, forward another about 10,000 years in time or so. Um, to talk about touch DNA from an ancient pendant and how that can also be used to identify uh, interactions between Homo sapiens and the tools that they made. So we'll start with Ronis, which I was quite lucky because this was not far from where I did my PhD. Mm -hmm. um, and as you can see, uh, now Ronis is quite a nice uh, village town, has a castle. And this castle uh, here was originally excavated in the 1930s, as you can see in this photo here, uh, right underneath this corner of the castle. And why this became an area of interest almost 100 years later was because what they found there were these leaf point lithics. And these leaf points uh, became a typeface of this transitional technology called the Lincolnian Renaissance Urmenwichian, or we're going to call it the LRJ. Um, and it represents just one of these transition technologies that happened during the Upper Paleolithic. And why I call them transition technologies is because they occurred during this change from Neanderthals to humans. And there's a huge question as to who made, who made these. And the reason that this is debated is also because, uh, you know, as humans, we like to think that we can do things that other people or other groups can't do. And so there's a lot of debate over the uh, who was capable to make these types of tools. And currently it's unknown who actually made them. Was it Neanderthals or was it uh, Homo sapiens? And this has been a large debate for many, many years. And up until this point, the idea was that this technology occurred about 40 to 40,000 years, 4,000 years ago. And so in 2016, um, a team that was headed, uh, initiated by Jean-Jacques Houblin, who was the director of the MPI uh, Department for Human Evolution, and uh, Marcel Weiss, who at the beginning was a PhD student, um, now he's a faculty member, but uh, really headed up this excavation. And as you can see in blue here, uh, this is looking down at the site, and we are going to talk, this is an archaeological research facility, we are going to look at some site pictures. Um, and was opened up, but then we really tunneled down to one column to look quite deep within the stratigraphy to try and find these LRJ layers. And this was quite a challenge, and I just really want to emphasize that for those people who don't go to sites, how much work this truly is. This is a site picture before anything happened. This is just the beginning. This is when I came in 2018 to do some sediment sampling here. And then at the end, this is what it started to look like. At one point, there was a huge rock that was uh, found that needed to be removed, which was a huge like year-long project. And then at the very, very end of it, of the excavation, there was an eight meter or 26 hole foot, uh, foot hole that went all the way down that for those of us afraid of heights like me was quite scary to then go down and take, collect samples. Um, but this was just quite a Herculean effort to uh, excavate at this site. Um, and at the end, we had a nice stratigraphy. And the reason that this was this effort is because, you know, here's the top here, and we had to go all the way down to these red layers to look at the LRJ. 
And we were able to link these uh, red layers, sorry, from here, this is a new excavation to the old excavation, which is also shown in red. And we did find some lithics from layer H of the new excavation that was similar to what was found in the old. Um, and we were able to use chronology, uh, which I'll talk about a bit more later, uh, by Helen Fulis, who took samples. This is just looking at the layers around the LRJ. And what you want to see is basically what we see here, where you have a nice smooth line transition down to the stratigraphy that shows kind of the integrity of the chronology that it's quite uh, smooth and then going older as you go down and so back in time. And with these dates, we were able to say that these LRJ layers were dated to around 47 and a half to 43,000 years ago. And if you remember, this is older than what was previously thought. So that in itself with just the chronology was an exciting find. We didn't just look at chronology. Um, isotopic work was done led by Sarah Pedrazani, where she found that the climatic conditions during this time period were quite a bit colder than they are today. Um, this means that uh, whatever group was there interacted with very cold temperatures and had to live and survive in that environment. We also, the uh, Jeff Smith led the uh, zoo archeological analysis and found that there was low levels of anthropogenic modifications which meant that there's there's more carnivore activity than human activity at the site. And so taken together, this uh, created this picture of whichever groups were there, they were there for a short period of time and in cold environmental conditions. But of course we want to know, well, what were these hominin groups? So Dora looked through over 1000 uh, non-diagnostic bone fragments to try and figure out which ones were hominin that we could try and answer that question with. She used zooms to do that and identified eight out of that 1300 that were hominin. At the same time, Alain Rougier uh, did some morphological analysis on some of the uh, collection from the original excavation. Uh, and she identified five potential hominin fragments. And so then I worked on this set of skeletal remains to see what exact group were they. Were they Homo sapiens or Neanderthals or, you know, someone else? <laughs> uh, but uh, we were excited to find that they were indeed Homo sapiens. When we looked at the mitochondrial DNA, every single one of them supported that lineage and compared to other previously published uh, mitochondria. And these are all of the IDs. But what's important and what was exciting to see as well is that several of them had the exact same mitochondria. And so that doesn't necessarily mean the same individual, but that means that they came from either the same individual or maternal relative, but also you see that they're from different excavations. And so this also helped tie the two excavations together and confirm that we actually do have overlapping data sets. Uh, I was able to put these mitochondria into a mitochondrial tree. And the main thing I really want to point out here is that all of these red uh, labels are the rawness individuals, and you see that most of them all group together, and they're all uh, kind of surrounding this blue one, which is Laddie Kuhn, which is an individual uh, from the Czech Republic that the date is unsure, but it's, uh, this individual is also thought to be one of the earliest Homo sapiens to have arrived in Europe. We also see that there's one individual up here that uh, clusters more with Humane too, which is an individual from Italy. And to better understand this relationship, we do need to have nuclear DNA, which unfortunately is not included in this project. Um, to really zoom in on the time period of these humans re in relationship to other LRJ associated uh, sites, this was performed by Helen Fulis. And it shows here that the rawness uh, layers, which are shown at the bottom, really are older than the previous dates. And so it's pushing back the LRJ at least in German or in Ranis about 2000 years earlier than previously thought. Uh, so taken together, we can now associate the Ranis LRJ with Homo sapiens. This also due to the time period really solidifies that Neanderthals and Homo sapiens were in Europe for an extended period of time together. It also shows that Homo sapiens reached further north than previously thought in colder climates. So there was a theory before that maybe Homo sapiens uh, followed a change to warmer climates north, and that's how we migrated up. But this shows that that seems to not be at least part of the whole story. Um, and yeah, so it shows they're slightly these early pioneer groups were quite small as they were moving through. And all of these results are described in much greater detail in three different publications that came out. Uh, earlier this year. 
Um, so that's how we can learn a little bit. And there's other, you know, many of these sites that have different types of these transitional uh, technologies throughout Central Europe. But this is a story from just one of them. And now I want to move a little further east uh, to Borsuka Cave to talk about Upper Paleolithic burials. So during the Upper Paleolithic, um, there are uh, there's been an abundance of burials that have been found. They're usually typified by uh, an abundance of grave goods, so jewelry, beads, and pendants, like the one pictured here, as well as using red ochre on the remains, as you can see on the far right. Um, we also there's also several instances of multiple burials, and so two or three individuals buried together. Uh, and to currently, the thought is that might, well, most of them have been identified as being male. Um, are the individuals who are buried. And if we look at the locations of um, the sites, so each of the ones that are circled in red or in red and the left are all burials. Um, all the other ones are just Upper Paleolithic sites. And during the Upper Paleolithic, there are two types of cultures that are often talked about. The Orgnation, which is here shown in blue, which is earlier, which then led to the Gravettian, which is in yellow. And there's a lot of questions currently about how the uh, Gravettian originated, where did it originate, and how did it move throughout Europe? Um, that That's not clearly understood. And part of Understanding that, of course, is increasing amount of data with both uh, cultural practices, so the findings of these artifacts, as well as genetics. And so we're going to try and add one piece to that puzzle by focusing on this one right in the center, which is Borsuka Cave, where we have no DNA to date and no association of a specific type of technology. Uh, so this site was originally excavated and uh, continues to be uh, work there continues to be led by Jarek. Um, it was done initially back in 2007, and the, one of the exciting findings there were all of these uh, pendants of teeth from um, ungulates, and some of them also had ochre on them, and one of the thoughts is it could be a necklace. We don't actually know if it was a necklace, but they look really pretty put together. Um, so they had 112 pendants that were found, but also six deciduous teeth of an infant. And so this led to the idea that this may have been a burial, there was two uh, radiocarbon dates that were performed back then, but they didn't overlap. So that raised a lot of questions as to what time period was this actually from? Um, were these just random pendants that were put here and just happened to be mixed together? What's the actual full story? And so, yeah, so there's lots of questions. And the reason that these questions haven't been answered is because this is a pretty challenging case. Uh, first, when we're talking just about infant teeth, these are really very, very small. Uh, these are the smallest um, specimen I've ever sampled and they were terrifying to do that. Um, so we don't have a lot of material available. We want to perform genetic and radiocarbon dating and with the amount of material that would you would usually use for just one of those analyses. And because of the time when this was uh, was originally excavated, we knew that there was likely gonna be a lot of contamination. And so how are we going to deal with this? Um, and I just wanna also explain why there's the question about if this was a burial. So this is if you're looking down at the site and each of these black points here are the pendants and they're kind of spread across. And so this could have been done, maybe there was a water wash that went through and spread them out, but that's part of the reason why it's no, you know, not a clear burial. And then each of these uh, red circles is one of the infant teeth that was found. The other infant teeth were found during seeding. And so there's not as strong of an association with the pendants and the infant teeth. Uh, Helen Fulis, who also did a dating in Ronish, she'll come up again later too, I think, uh, <laughs> performed the dating for this site. And unfortunately, this uh, does not look as clean and pretty as Ronis did. We see that the dates are a bit all over the place. Um, this was, as I said, a very complicated picture and challenge, and there's a couple hypotheses as to what might lead to these uh, non-overlapping dates. One is that maybe these pendants did come from different time periods. Maybe the original teeth came from different times, but then were reworked later into pendants is another option. Um, another could be that there is contamination that is making the dates younger than they actually are. And so we're not quite sure actually which of those is the correct answer, um, but that may explain uh, some of the discrepancies in these dates. 
Um, when you do look at these dates in context with dates of other sites that have been assigned to the org nation or the Gravettian, you kind of see why this is also so frustrating because you have the human teeth up on top here, which overlap with the Gravettian, and then these pendants that most of them seem to overlap with the org nation. Mm -hmm. And again, does that mean these are two different events? Does that mean that the human dates are um, contaminated and therefore artificially younger? We can't quite completely disentangle this. Um, I also just want to emphasize uh, what a feat it was to even have dates. Helen used uh, less than 42 milligrams of dentine in order to do the dating um, using a technique that she developed during her PhD. Um, I then worked on the genetics side and using nuclear DNA, we were able to identify that this infant was a female. And so we have the oldest uh, infant burial of a female um, and showing that it wasn't just small boys that were buried, but also girls. Um, we found that the MT DNA from this infant was actually relatively rare during this time period that so far only one other individual has been sat found with a similar MT. Uh, and interestingly, they actually have the exact same MT, but that could just mean that they lived within uh, about 1500 years of each other just due to mutation rates. Um, as I mentioned, contamination and amount of data was an issue. It was also an issue for the data with the genetics. We only had 30,000 SNPs. And to put this into context, a lot of the large genetic studies that you see typically have millions. And so this is, we. I was really on the edge of what I could you know, work with. And I was trying to look at what was the association of our Vasukra individual, which is in red, I'm actually using this, uh, red here versus the uh, blue and the um, yellow ones. And with different statistics, we could see no significant difference in association, unfortunately. And so we were not quite able to clarify this association, although we could confidently say this was an upper Paleolithic burial and not something younger. Um, so this study really does show that you, the uh, power of doing these types of analyses together. We were able to identify the earliest uh, female infant burial. Um, and we were able to directly date everything to over 30,000 years. And this was published uh, last year in iScience. And this brings us to the last story that I will tell today, which brings us quite far east, all the way to Denise of a cave. Um, and I want you to remember some of those numbers, like 30,000 SNPs, as I talk about uh, <laughs> this paper. Uh, this data was generated around the same time, and you'll see where I was what frustrated by the last project when we see what happened with this one. So unlike the previous two projects where I became involved either from the start or very uh, early on, this project was initiated by this team of four people, uh, Matthias and Elena from uh, Leipzig from the MPI and Risa Vesey and Ellen, um, where they really want to try and non-destructively recover human uh, DNA from lithics. And I was brought in later um, to do the genetic analysis of this, but I really just want to acknowledge their work from the start. Um, and the reason that they thought this could be possible is that if we look at uh, a bone, as you see here, it's a porous material. And so for anyone who has jewelry, you often play with it. And the idea is that your DNA, your sweat, uh, anything could uh, penetrate the bone matrix and then become preserved. And how this really happens uh, from a chemical perspective is that you have a portion of bone is hydroxyapatite, which has calcium, which is positively charged, and DNA has its negatively charged backbone. And then through an electrostatic interaction, it binds, and that's where we believe it's preserved and can stay for thousands of years. And so that was the hope. And so they set off on this uh, journey to attempt to perform this recovery. And a huge part of this quest was to do this non-destructively. When we're talking about bone tools, these are really, really valuable artifacts uh, and informative for future analysis. You do not want to destroy them. And so um, Ellen performed all these surface measurements where they did these tests of different buffers and treatments on uh, bone. And then they looked at the scans before and after to identify which buffers were actually non-destructive. And I'm hoping that you will agree that when we found the sodium phosphate, that the picture on the left looks virtually the same as the picture on the right to show they had a non-destructive technique. 
Uh, and what's exciting about the phosphate, because as we see, we have phosphate there, is if we add the phosphate buffer, sorry, the idea is that the DNA will release from the hydroxyapatite, and then the sodium phosphate that has been added will bind in its place, leaving the DNA loose for us to recover and perform our analyses on. And that's how we believe that this is working. Um, and so uh, Elena established this workflow where in an ideal case, we have um, an artifact that's fresh and clean from the excavation, and it's cleaned with water before going into the phosphate treatment for DNA extraction. And so she tested this initially on a set of mammalian bone tools where they knew what type of animal that uh, bone tool is made from. And what they found is that for a good portion of them, they could correctly assign the animal based on just this non-destructive uh, technique. And they also found for one of them, they actually got a human DNA. And that's where I became involved in the project. Um, and this pendant actually came from Denise of a cave, and it actually came from out of a collaboration from, that I was working on for my PhD on sediment DNA from Denise of a cave. So it was quite nice to get to work on this data set as well. And what they found when they looked at the amount of human mitochondrial DNA that was recovered, they saw where well, there's a little bit that came off in the early cleaning stages that kind of went away. And then you see that it increases to the highest amount at the end in the final hot phosphate washes. And so that led to some initial optimism that this could actually be the user or the former person who touched this pendant. Um, I was able to reconstruct a mitochondrial genome from it and identify that it belonged to haplogroup U, which makes sense for the time period. Also, because we did not want to perform destructive analysis, we did not want to directly date this pendant. Um, and there wasn't quite, we don't have OSL dates yet for those layers either. So I did perform a molecular dating and was able to estimate that it's around 20,000 years old, which does make sense with the known chronology of Denise of a cave at the time. Um, and another important portion is that the DNA for this, the mitochondrial DNA was dominated by one type of mitochondria. So that also helps us believe that it's either from one individual predominantly or their maternal relatives, which is also good for uh, genetic analysis. Uh, and before I get into some of the nuclear results to just orient us to what the world looked like at that time or what our current knowledge and understanding is, um, is that we know from the upper Paleolithic of Siberia that there was two populations, this A and E group uh, in yellow, and then this Northeastern Asian ancestry and brown kind of on the right. And those combined to create a population, which is what populated uh, the Americas. We know that this A and E ancestry disappeared around uh, 10,000 years ago and was fully replaced. Um, however, as you can see from the blue number of triangles, this has all been put together by very limited amounts of data. We just have a few individuals. Denise of a cave is located around here, um, just to give you an idea of the placement. And so we were excited to potentially see uh, how this individual could fit in. I was especially excited because in our sediment DNA, we were not able to get that high quality of nuclear DNA out from here. Uh, and what we found as just a quick look, I will talk through this, is the more yellow or red a color is, the higher the genetic association, the more blue it is, the lower the genetic association, and the triangles are modern populations. So if we look at just the triangles, we'll see that the most warm colors are in either Europe or the Americas. And so that makes sense with what I just told you of that the Sib these Siberian populations contributed uh, to the peopling of the Americas. And then if we look at the reddest color, we see that it's this Malta or the AG3. And those are the two individuals that to now constitute the entire a &E population as we know it. <laughs> and so, um, again, we don't have, you know, so many, so, so much data from this time period. Um, when we looked further at the nuclear DNA, we saw that this individual was also a female. Uh, and when we look at a PCA, and the genetic data, limiting it to two different types of data sets, but the same data, we see that this, which are these red points, we see that they are closest to these green ones, which is the a &E population. And so this combined with some other genetic analyses allow, oh, I also want to mention, I did this, at this point, we had over 300,000 SNPs. So I had 10 times the data for this analysis with a non-destructive technique than the previous analysis 
that was a destructive technique just because this was a fresh, newly excavated tooth as part of it, but also maybe because it was from the magical Denise of a cave, who knows? Um, but I was, you know, generating this data at the same time. And as you can imagine, quite frustrated <laughs> that I couldn't get the same quality of data out of the Borsuka tooth. But this is what happens sometimes. Um, so the big output of this, I mean, of course, we have another individual from a &E population, which can change and expand what we can learn about that time period, and that location. But it also shows how we can directly now associate an individual potentially with what they touched before, instead of having always to rely on associating different artifacts with um, bones and assuming that those were together. Um, so in summary, I've talked you through, you know, quite a spread geographically and through time. This is just three examples of the types of studies that are going on during this time period. Uh, this is going to be especially, I think, exciting to see how especially some of these trans technology transitions are identified. I'm hoping that there'll be more and more of that happening over the next few years. Who knows? But um, that's a huge area of continued discussion and exploration. Um, yeah. Um, there's also it's continued work looking into the Gravettian and trying to understand its origins as it swept to the southwest of Europe as well. And I hope that we can use some of these non-destructive techniques to add to that picture. Um, I have a couple of slides of acknowledgement, so just hold your breath for a second. Um, I really want to acknowledge all of the, I mean, as you can imagine, this is a small percentage of the people who contributed to all of these studies. These were each uh, huge efforts on their own. I just in particular want to acknowledge and thank the members of the Maya group, which is where I did my PhD, the excavation group at Ranis, who, as I said, did a huge, huge job. I want to thank the Miller Institute for funding me. A lot of this data was all generated during my PhD, but I did perform a lot of the analysis while I was here at Berkeley. And so the Miller really allowed me the flexibility to do this. Um, I also, as was alluded to in my introduction, I do work in forensics as well from a genetics perspective. There is a lot of overlap as in both instances you're trying to reconstruct, whether it's the recent past, as in maybe just a couple of years ago, or the far distance past, a lot of these analyses are the same. And I know that holds true for a lot of archaeological uh, techniques as well. And so I always like to throw pitches for increased collaboration across these fields. Um, I want to acknowledge the groups that I'm in now, as well as highlight some of the group uh, work that's happening in the Morjani lab currently, looking at analyses with uh, sediment DNA, where I've had the great honor of working with two stellar students on that. So stay tuned for exciting things to come from them. And I just want to say that I will be actually leaving Berkeley sometime in the next year or so to go to the University of Copenhagen, where I'll continue to work on the intersection of forensics and ancient DNA, but I'll be moving up to more Bronze Age time period, but I'm always happy to also talk about collaborations and keep working. I've really enjoyed my time here in Berkeley. And so with that, I want to just thank you all for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions.